interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash. A date which will live in infamy. Harbor. The German news agency said today in a broadcast that the Allied invasion had begun. The first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. This first satellite will today successfully launched in the U.S. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence Roger, by the military G, industrial find, complex. Turning around. Missiles in Cuba oh, add to an already clear and present Somehow nation. Somehow this situation can and will President Kennedy and Texas Governor John Connolly were shot. I'm about to sign into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964. I shall resign the presidency effective. The U.S. Embassy in Tehran remains occupied by Iranian students. I urge Mr. Gorbachev to send a new signal by tearing down that wall. The skies of the Baghdad have been illuminated. The front of this building has been ripped off. By this it is completely blast. impossible to understand why this is happening. If a random world shapes our lives, there are those among us who work to shape the world. Edward A. Malloy grew up in Washington, D.C., where he starred as a high school basketball player, where a childhood friend nicknamed him Monk and where he first learned from an expert how the world could be shaped. My father was uh, always very active in church matters. My mother was too in her own way, but my father was a Knights of Columbus. He uh, helped integrate uh, the Knights of Columbus in Washington. He and I were both involved in uh, planning uh, for Martin Luther King's uh, March on Washington. People were uh, claiming it was gonna be uh, blood in the streets and ended up being obviously one of the great moments in American history, but also a very peaceful day. We were always very close, and he was somebody that I always uh, not only loved, but looked up to and admired. Uh, when he died uh, on the altar, half the people were African American, uh, priests and deacons, which I think was a testimony to the influence he had. It was amazing when we went back for his, his mother's funeral, the, the racial mix. Uh, of folks that were there at the uh, funeral liturgy. And I remember afterwards talking with Monk and saying, I wish we would have had a chance to go by and just see your house, see where you grew up. And he said, house? He said, I never grew up in a house. He said, that was always an issue with my mother. He said, whenever we had a little bit of money, we didn't have much. He said, my father was always giving it away. People that see the picture of my father at comparable times in our two lives see that we have a great facial resemblance. Between my eighth grade of grade school and my sophomore year of high school, I grew six inches. And I can remember lying in bed at night, feeling myself growing. I could just stretch and I could just feel bones increasing in size. Sports made Notre Dame possible for Monk. And by the time he graduated in 1963, he'd decided to enter the priesthood but it would be seven years before ordination in 1970. And a lot was going on in the world. I was in the seminary when Martin Luther King was assassinated and uh, in Washington. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Was there were riots that night. And uh, I was very taken watching the news reports. So the next day I decided to take a car with one of my seminary classmates and go and see the areas. I ended up on 14th Street, this is the day after, and all hell broke loose and car stalled out and uh, we had blocks, uh, bottles and rocks thrown through the windshield. Every, every piece of glass was shattered. I got the car started and I made it over to Georgia Avenue and there was a riot there. And Finally I went over to the 12th Precinct House in Northeast and there was one cop in there and the radio was rattling with all the things going on and he said, I said, I'm here to report an incident. And he looked at me. He said, uh, anybody get hurt? He said, I said, no. He said, get out of here. He said, the whole city's up for grabs. You want to report an incident? As a deacon and then a priest at Notre Dame, Monk's passion for teaching was obvious. By the early 80s, he was seen as being one of the several young priests who might someday ascend to the office of president. 
And when a legendary priest named Hesburgh retired in 1986, Edward Monk Malloy was elected the first new president of Notre Dame in 35 years. There were big shoes to fill, but he was up to the challenge. There are uh, specific things that I articulated when I took over that are kind of my general. Uh, Town-gown relationship would be an example. Multicultural and co-educational realities would be another. A focus on the Catholic mission and identity. Internationalization, a continuation of our excellence in undergraduate instruction. We're teaching across the board, but trying to elevate our capacity as a research institution and a professional training place. I mean, I said all of those right when I took over. From the very beginning, uh, it was important to Monk that uh, the University of Notre Dame be very much involved in the local community. The Homeless Center, the Robinson Center, and those were all Monk's initiatives, things he was interested in. He's an urban guy. The university's relationship with the local community has never been stronger, and that speaks very powerfully to his vision. He senses very much that uh, you know we're, we're part of this community. We're not this university sitting up on a hill separate from the community, and that was something that he made, was made very clear to all of us in the very beginning. I think in his wisdom, he realizes a healthy neighborhood makes for a healthy university. Look at all of the things that have taken place here at home and the influence that the university has had uh, under Monk's leadership. We don't see Monk in the neighborhood, but we certainly feel his presence and his influence into the neighborhood. And it's an extraordinary story of a partnership between a school uh, and a town. If I could have been president and we never built one building, that would have been okay with me. Now, that would have been unrealistic because you've got to have new facilities. Ultimately, I think he sees the academy as people um, more than just the buildings, even though he will go down probably in history as the, the uh, president that expanded the campus uh, the most. But we clearly had some understanding, a very strong understanding of what was important. We had a committee looking at a lot of things related to athletics. It was almost all faculty. They came out of that process recommending the expansion of the stadium. This coming summer, we'll open up the uh, Googly Amino facility. It's going to be a spectacular place, not only because of the quality of, of the environment, but as a, a showpiece for recruiting and other sorts of things. What you see here is Notre Dame having a clear sense of what it wanted to be, a Catholic research university, and, and set out to do that. Um, that meant bringing people here that would fit into that kind of future. And uh, then you have to build the buildings uh, to support that kind of vision. The Center for the Performing Arts. It took me 18 years to get the thing open. But how we decide the relationship between new facilities and the people things, you have to keep a sense of scale and perspective about that. On a special night each May, Graduating seniors visit the grotto one by one to say goodbye to the university by lighting one last candle. Few of them aware that a friend sits quietly on a bench in the distance, just as he's done year after year, absorbing it all his own humble way as teacher, a priest, and the president of their university. Reverend Edward A. Monk Malloy, President of the University of Notre Dame.